Millions have used anabolic steroids, including those you'd least suspect. No drug is so reviled, yet so misunderstood. The fact of the matter is, you want our athletes using steroids. From researchers, users, and abusers come stories from inside the world of steroids and a view of how steroids work from inside the body. What do we know about the real risks? And you cannot prove cause and effect. You just can't do it. And can science separate fact from fiction in the steroids debate? In 2005, some of baseball's greatest players addressed Congress on steroid use in professional sports. Members of the committee, distinguished guests, my name is Jose Canseco, and for 17 years I played professional baseball. In his book and during testimony, Canseco spoke of rampant steroid use in baseball. Since then, more heroes have fallen. In 2007, Major League Baseball took a major blow. In a massive investigation, the Mitchell Report implicated over 80 players from all 30 clubs for using performance-enhancing substances. Those named included home run record holder Barry Bonds and star pitcher Roger Clemens. Both have denied the accusations. But for pro athletes in all sports, millions of dollars in world records can ride on gaining the slightest edge. And that's when many turn to steroids. Anabolic steroids are now banned in every major sporting organization. In the U.S., anabolic steroids are also illegal without a prescription. Yet, more than a million Americans have admitted using them illegally. The real number of users is anyone's guess. Other than pedophilia, this is the most secretive behavior I've ever encountered. I've had people admit they've hit their spouse, that they've used cocaine, heroin, amphetamines. They'll admit all that before they will anabolic steroids. In pro sports, adamant denials are par for the course. Are you taking a fifth? I'm not here to discuss the past. I have never used steroids, period. There's probably not an athlete alive at any level that hasn't considered using steroids, at least at some point in their career. Are steroids dangerous? Many doctors say yes. How dangerous? Doctors disagree. I'm far more concerned about tobacco and alcohol, methamphetamines, crystal meth, cocaine and heroin, by a long shot, than I am anabolic steroids. However, that does not give us license to ignore it or not aggressively deal with the problem. There tend to be highly opinionated people on both sides of the aisle, both groups of whom have opinions that are substantially beyond anything that the actual data can support. Science isn't the only voice in the debate. Others have something to say. The champion who turned his back on steroids. The father who lost a child to steroids. And even the athletes who defend steroids. Few understand steroids better than Kieran Kidder. Kieran is a competitive power lifter. He used supplements for more than 15 years. At times, that included steroids. I'm getting ready to go to the gym here in a little bit. What are you training today? <clears throat> Back and legs. Gonna dead. Kidder is also the founder of the World Powerlifting Organization. Today it starts. I personally like to train about mid-morning. So I come out and I'll, you know, try to have a little bit to eat, like an hour or two before I'm going to train. He believes steroids are a widely misunderstood drug. Preconceived notions are that it's similar to doing narcotics and you're, you know, wrapping a rubber band around your arm like a junkie does. But it's no different than taking, you know, a multivitamin on a daily basis. You know, it's just part of a routine. Like this shot of vitamin B12, injectable steroids are taken the exact same way. And Kidder's earlier use of steroids gives him an insider's perspective on how to use them. I always start out with injectables for a few weeks and then add different orals in over about a 16-week period. 
known as stacking, many believe that mixing several different steroids may produce better results. It's good to have a few different compounds in you than an abundance of one. So that just keeps your receptors always clicking and popping and pulling the stuff into your body and utilizing it to the, the best that it can. Many experts believe that steroids can push the physiologic limits of the muscle, making it bigger, faster, and stronger than it could get naturally. These drugs will take you places that you can lift for 50 years and you'll never get to naturally. They're that potent. Steroids affect the body by enhancing the natural process of muscle building. The key to building muscle is protein synthesis and cellular repair. Skeletal muscle is made up of long fibrous chains containing proteins. Bundles of thousands of fibers make up the muscle itself. When an athlete engages in a heavy workout, this structure is damaged, causing micro tears in the muscle fibers. The body naturally repairs this damage by mending the torn fibers. The result is a muscle that's larger and stronger than before. And with each additional workout, the athlete adds bulk, strength, and speed. With steroids, muscle repair can come faster, much faster. A normal person, when they work out, they're going to break down their muscle and it takes about 48 hours in between workouts for your muscles to repair themselves. Well, anabolic steroids speed up that process. So rather than taking 48 hours, it may be only 24 hours. So you're able to work out more frequently, longer, more intensely, and then recover faster so you can work out again. Not only that, they may raise the performance ceiling of the muscle. Scientists realized the potential of anabolic steroids soon after they appeared. In 1939, German scientist Adolf Boutinant won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry for his pioneering work on testosterone. Hitler refused to let him accept the prize. But from World War to the Cold War, Germany pioneered steroids research. At the 1976 Olympics in Montreal, East German athletes won 40 gold medals, including 11 in women's swimming. During the 70s, the East Germans had a phenomenal record in the pool. And it wasn't until about 20 years later when it finally emerged that they had a drug program in place and they were just taking all the medals, literally. By the end of the 1970s, steroids had infected sports in other countries. But steroids was not yet a household word. Then in rushed Ben Johnson. And they're out. Ben Johnson, Carl Lewis, Carl Lewis is way out. And Ben Johnson really has it. Looking for Gray is the second. And it's Ben Johnson, and he's going to walk. Ben Johnson first. In 1988, the Canadian sprinter won the gold in the 100 meter dash in the Seoul Olympic Games, shattering the world record. A urine test revealed his secret. Ben Johnson did two things. One is he got his medal taken away for doping with anabolic steroids. Two is he ran the fastest 100 meters that had ever been recorded in world history. So he showed really the world that these were effective drugs. Because when Ben Johnson came back without steroids two years later, the headlines were, Ben Johnson is back, and he's slower. Johnson had a third achievement. He helped the public equate steroids with cheating. Sort of like using a bicycle if you were running a race. It was against the spirit of sport. Although steroid use was deemed cheating by the rules of sport, they were not yet classified as illegal. After the Johnson scandal, the U.S. Congress held hearings on outlawing the non-medical use of anabolic steroids. Those opposed included the American Medical Association, the Food and Drug Administration, even the Drug Enforcement Administration. All testified that steroids were an addictive and didn't meet the criteria for becoming a controlled substance. 
Despite this, in 1990, Congress voted to make steroids illegal without a prescription. The first shot in a war against cheating in sports had been fired. But many athletes could get around that. They could find steroids through trainers, fellow athletes, and even doctors willing to write prescriptions. And in the 90s, Kieran Kidder didn't need a prescription. He also knew where to find black market steroids. But the law was close behind. Back in 1996, I got arrested for possession of them. Somebody ratted me out, spent four months in jail. My whole life has never been the same since. Yet he still believes they have their place in sports. I've taken them and I've taken lots of them. I just don't recommend that just anybody takes it. If you know what you're doing, there is a safe way of doing it. There absolutely is. Most who take steroids think there's minimum risk or low risk or risk they can handle. But that's the problem. This very powerful hormone that's going to your brain, it's going to your muscles, it's going to your liver, it's going everywhere and it's changing you. The challenge for science is proving it. But not all steroids are created equal. For every athlete who secretly injects steroids, there's someone like this man who legally uses a different type of steroid right out in the open. There are several classes of steroids. Most often confused are anabolic steroids and corticosteroids. Both are synthetic versions of hormones produced naturally in the body, but they perform two completely different tasks. Athletes use anabolic steroids to build muscle. Corticosteroids are used by doctors to reduce inflammation. Everything from arthritis medication to asthma inhalers contain corticosteroids. Unlike anabolic steroids, they cannot build muscle. But anabolic steroids have their place in legitimate medicine as well. There are a few things that anabolic steroids are used for, and I use them in my practice as well. I use them for men, usually older men, who lose the ability to make their own testosterone. Other doctors prescribe steroids to treat muscle loss, anemia, stunted growth, and delayed puberty. Anabolic steroids are simply synthetic versions of testosterone, the primary male hormone. In short, they're man-made versions of natural testosterone produced in a lab instead of the body. So if we're going to give somebody testosterone, all we're doing is giving them back what their body would normally be making. It's not giving them any more than that. But if you do take more than the physiologic dose, the results can be dramatic. And chemistry may be the key to pushing the muscle beyond its natural performance envelope. For unknown reasons, when an athlete trains intensely, natural testosterone levels in the body drop precipitously, sometimes to that of a castrated man. The body also releases another hormone called glucocorticoids to reduce inflammation. But glucocorticoids have a second effect. They are catabolic, meaning they break down muscle tissue. It's a double whammy against the muscle, a drop in testosterone, and an increase in muscle-wasting hormone. It's speculated that steroids affect the hormone imbalance in two ways. First, they may replenish testosterone levels after a workout, accelerating muscle repair. They may also block the muscle-wasting effects of glucocorticoids. The result is a muscle that quickly gets bigger and stronger. For athletes, inhibiting these two roadblocks to muscle building provides a huge advantage. It does take athletes to the next level. If you are swinging a bat, you can use a heavier bat, or you can swing it faster. If you're running, sprinting, you can run faster. That's why you find so many athletes using them. Steroids are incredibly effective. A young guy who eats badly, sleeps badly, smokes, drinks too much alcohol, misses half of his gym workouts, and takes steroids, can blow away the most dedicated, most gifted athlete who does not take steroids in terms of sheer muscle gain. 
but to achieve those gains takes high doses of steroids. Most doctors prescribe anabolic steroids in what they call a physiologic dose. The amount of testosterone a man produces naturally. Some endurance athletes who want to reduce recuperation between workouts use a physiologic dose of steroids. Some sprinters with higher strength and power needs may use twice the natural amount. But what about bodybuilders and weightlifters? In some of the studies that we have done, we have encountered guys who are taking the equivalent of 100 times the natural output of testosterone. In other words, if you figure that the normal male testis manufactures between 50 and 75 milligrams of testosterone a week, we've seen guys who are taking five or 6,000 milligrams of testosterone or its equivalent per week from injections or pills. And the more you take, the bigger you can get. For many athletes, anabolic steroids seem like the proverbial fountain of youth. Steroids have profound effects. You could see results in as little as two weeks, maybe even less. You'll start to actually see an increase in muscle size pretty rapidly. If you train for endurance, your muscles are going to take on endurance-like characteristics. If you train for strength, your muscles are going to take on strength characteristics. And if you're going to train for size, your muscles are going to take on size-like characteristics. Most athletes have a small window of opportunity. In some sports, it may only be a few years. I can understand when an athlete comes to me, a 19-year-old kid comes to me on the brink of signing a $50 million contract, numbers that most of us can't even imagine at 19 years of age. What is your choice going to be? It's, it's clear cut. And, and as, as bad as that sounds, as a coach, I'm telling the kids how to try to do this naturally. That's when some athletes turn to anabolic steroids for an extra edge to beat the clock and cash in on success. But the risks of indiscriminate steroid use remain undefined, and many experts fear that these users may eventually pay a medical price. In 1991, one athlete became the poster boy for steroid dangers. Former NFL player Lyle Alzado announced he was dying of central nervous system lymphoma. He blamed steroids. Yet even in his confession, Alzado diluted the dangers. And there was a double-edged sword to his comments that he made in Sports Illustrated. What he told the world is, yes, steroids cause my problem, but there is a safe way to take steroids but not without a doctor's supervision. Experts agree the abuse of steroids comes with several undesirable side effects. Men may experience a number of short-term cosmetic changes. They can include severe acne on the back, as well as on the face. Gynecomastia, the accumulation of fat under the nipples, causing the breasts to swell and even testicular atrophy, the shrinking of the testicles to half their normal size. For women, the androgenic or masculinizing side effects are more pronounced, including male pattern baldness, growth of facial hair, and even a permanent deepening of the voice. The breasts may also shrink and the clitoris enlarge. Other side effects are debatable. One is a spike in aggression from steroid use, known as roid rage. Atlanta authorities are investigating the bizarre murder-suicide involving professional wrestler Chris Benoit and are asking if steroids could have played a part. Animal and human studies show high doses of testosterone increase aggression. Yet few anabolic steroid users undergo a change of personality. Steroids make an unstable person more unstable. They make an aggressive person more aggressive. It's usually been a person who's had problems. So it hasn't been a Jekyll and Hyde where you've been a kind, caring, docile, a friendly person and turn them into an aggressive monster. Studies suggest only a minority of users turn violent. Between 1993 and 2000, Four double-blind clinical trials administered high doses of steroids to 109 men. Roughly 5% experienced reckless or aggressive behaviors. You can have 
five different guys who take the same dose of steroids, four of whom will have virtually no psychiatric changes, and one of whom will go completely berserk. Yet some doctors feel roid rage is exaggerated. You give me State College, Pennsylvania, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, on a football Saturday, and I will show you as many cases of alcohol-induced rage as you will see in the United States in 50 years from anabolic steroids. Roid rage isn't the only side effect under debate. People take steroids, men and women, because it works. But it comes at a price. The price, perhaps life itself. Professional bodybuilder Steve Mahalik was once Mr. USA, and Mr. America, and Mr. Universe. He was also a devout steroid user. Mahalik began using steroids in 1975 to prepare for the Mr. Universe competition. He kept using them for 10 years. He believes steroids help buy something priceless, the pinnacle of bodybuilding. I used them a ton, but you know, whatever comes up must come crashing down eventually. Finally, I collapsed on the stage and went to the hospital and I had two grapefruit-sized tumors on my liver. Mahalik embodied what many scientists believe. In the short term, steroids may build your body, but in the long run, you pay a price. On the outside, a steroid user might just look bigger, more masculine. But on the inside, doctors believe this could happen. One type of oral steroid has been linked to tumors and cancers of the liver. Others have suffered a rare condition called peliosis hepatitis, where blood-filled cysts form on the liver and can rupture, causing internal bleeding. Some studies also suggest that tumors can form on the kidneys, decreasing function. As the body loses its ability to filter the blood, toxins build up, leading to fluid retention, increased blood pressure, and eventually, kidney failure. But even more alarming is the effect of steroids on the heart. Steroids can dramatically alter cholesterol levels, increasing the risk of heart attack or stroke. A catalog of life-threatening diseases. Steve Mahalik has had them all. Liver tumors, pancreatitis, gallbladder disease, a heart attack, a stroke, and the list goes on. All my organs were shutting down one by one, piece by piece, and all my arteries were clogged, all seven in my heart. I had no blood going to my heart. The doctor opened me up. He said he saw more blood in a dead person than he saw of me being alive. Steve has company. Spare the pain, spare the shame. Let's go. My group of champion bodybuilders, 70, 80s bodybuilders, are now just starting getting bypass surgery, who's getting valve replacement surgery, who has liver problems, kidney problems, who died from a heart attack. It's all happening. No one ever smoked. They didn't drink. Our diets were impeccable. We exercised as well as did aerobic cardiovascular work. We followed every natural rule and law to keep us healthy and alive. Except, they all used steroids. That's the difference. There's that one variable. It's only one variable amongst all of us. But while Mahalik blames steroids, science has reservations. In the last 70 years that these drugs have been used in medicine, I'm not aware of any study that's evaluated their long-term effects. You know, a lot of what you see on, on some of these issues is case studies or anecdotes. So this person used steroids and he had a liver cancer, or he had a kidney tumor, and, and from a methodology standpoint, that's the lowest of the low. I mean, you cannot prove cause and effect. I mean, you just can't do it. Proving cause and effect is made harder by steroid users who often mix other drugs including growth hormone, insulin, thyroid hormone, and amphetamines. So you have this cauldron, this witch's brew, and then people ask me, well, anabolic steroids is in that cauldron. What effect do they have? 
in combination with all these other drugs. Got me. But it's interesting because it's always the steroids that are pinpointed as the culprit. For scientists, pinpointing the dangers of steroids has been difficult. The evidence may be there, but it has proven elusive. Science still doesn't know what is going to happen in the long term with steroids. On the one hand, there are hundreds of thousands of people who have used the drugs who don't appear superficially to be particularly the worst for wear. But then on the other hand, there are every few months stories about another old-time bodybuilder or athlete who abruptly died under somewhat mysterious circumstances. Pro wrestler Brian Pillman died at 35 of a heart attack. Wrestler Eddie Guerrero died at 38 from heart disease. And Davy Boy Smith was dead at 39. Three deaths in the last decade, all from heart disease and all with a common suspect. For years, doctors have suspected a link between steroids and heart disease. Steroids lower the level of HDL cholesterol in the bloodstream. Also known as good cholesterol, doctors believe HDL protects the cardiovascular system from heart disease. While steroid users may look perfectly healthy on the outside, the inside can tell a different story. Steroids can also dramatically raise bad cholesterol, or LDL. This can cause a hardening of the arteries and a significant buildup of plaque along the artery wall. As plaque clogs the artery, blood flow is restricted. If left unchecked, it can cause a heart attack. Likewise, if any plaque breaks off, it can lodge in smaller blood vessels, causing a heart attack or stroke. And the damage can be done after only a few years of steroid use. Exhibit A is Danny McDermott. Now a 54-year-old financial advisor, Danny was once a champion bodybuilder. Back when I was competing, and you want to be at that you know, national level, that international level, you could bet your competitions using steroids. So was Danny. At 36, seven years after quitting steroids in bodybuilding, he took a body blow. The you know, doctor came and said, you just had a massive heart attack and you're lucky to be alive. McDermott is now a patient of Dr. Larry Santora, a director of cardiac CT at California's Orange County Heart Institute. In the fall of 2006, Santora, published the first ever observational study on steroids and heart disease. It was also the first study to use an electron beam CT scanner to see how much plaque had built up in steroid users. A significant amount had severe plaque at a very early age in their 30s, the type of plaque that you might see in somebody in their uh, 70s or 80s. All three of your major arteries you have atherosclerosis or plaque in each of those. To get to this level of, of bodybuilding and, and a professional athlete who uses it and performs, they're going to need to take it for several years, and that's when you're going to start to see the effect. And these guys have been doing it for 10, 12, 15 years, and they're going to uh, die suddenly. We're going to see people, instead of dying in their 70s or late 60s, in their 40s, 50s, maybe even in their mid-30s. I'm lucky that I got through all that so far, but I don't think I would do it again. Knowing what I know today, I would not do it again. Despite his findings, Santora can't prove his fears. His study group was too small to draw big conclusions. The problem with studying illicit drug use in general, and with steroids in particular, is that you just can't go out and do a laboratory study. You can't intentionally put people on steroids for 20 years to find out what happens to them because the Human Studies Committee would not permit that.
So for ethical reasons, the only way that you can study these phenomena is just to go out there in nature and see what you can find. And when you do that, there are all kinds of methodological limitations which make it hard to get convincing solid results without the risk of some sort of distortion. As doctors search for answers, some steroid users ignore the danger signs. Some doctors blame their own profession. It took the medical community an amazingly long time to actually concede that steroids do work. Even today, you can still find, for example, in the physician's desk reference, statements that steroids have no value for enhancing athletic performance. So that having failed on that count, they were also discounted when they started talking about potential dangers of steroids because they had already lost their credibility. And with the loss of medical credibility came increased use. They're going to always be part of powerlifting and bodybuilding and strongman sports like that. But now you could go down to any high school that has, you know, big time sporting program and someone's going to have roids. All of the danger signs, everything we needed to know was right in front of us. In the Tour de France, blowouts usually happen during the race. In 2006, the big blowout happened three days after the race ended. The Tour de France has taken yet another blow as American Floyd Landis has tested positive for steroids. It is the first Officials announced they had found an abnormal ratio of testosterone in the urine of Floyd Landis, the American who won the tour. Landis was stripped of his title. It wasn't the tour's first steroid scandal. In 1998, so many riders were found with performance-enhancing drugs, the race was dubbed the Tour of Shame. I said years ago, and people raise their eyes, you can't win the Tour de France without drugs. It's been dirty since its inception. Not too many people are raising their eyebrows about that statement anymore. From cycling to baseball, steroids can be found in almost every sport. Now, steroids are moving into arenas where the stakes are small, but the risks are just as high. They're going to always be part of powerlifting and bodybuilding and strongman sports like that, but they really have no business, in my opinion, being in baseball and football and these games that kids start out playing in their backyards. The most detrimental thing that a teenager can do is take steroids. But they are. And Taylor Hooten was one of them. One, two, three, one. Taylor was a great kid. Always had a smile on his face, cracking jokes. Very, very popular at school. And he must have been a good looking kid. Girls over here all the time. But he made great grades in school. He was carrying a 3.8 grade average. Uh, he'd made super scores on his SATs. And he and I were getting ready to make college visits. Taylor Hooten was an average 16-year-old high school student until January 2003. That's when he decided to try out for the varsity baseball team. In less than three months, he gained 30 pounds, along with acne, a puffy face, and bad breath. All side effects of steroids. According to the Centers for Disease Control, between 700 and 850,000 teens have used steroids. One in 20. All you need to do is read Jose Canseco's book. A clear message gets sent that, that, at least in his opinion, steroids were a panacea to success. What can be bad about earning millions of dollars, being on the TV every night, setting records, having the women fawn all over them? Very little downside has befallen our professional athletes, those that have chosen to use steroids. According to experts, few teens understand the dangers lurking in a growing steroid market. Today, steroids can be easily purchased online from labs in places like Mexico, Thailand, and India. We've heard stories of those vials being filled with flaxseed oil, all the way to those vials containing motor oil. And these kids, our children, are taking these and injecting them into the vein. Soon after Taylor began taking steroids, his personality changed. 
But what we saw in Taylor was something that was much more severe than normal mood swing. On two occasions, he took his pitching hand and drove it through a sheetrock wall. All of the danger signs, everything we needed to know was right in front of us. But we didn't recognize it as steroids because neither we nor our family doctor had been trained to know what to look for. While quitting steroids, Taylor slid into a deep depression. On the morning of July 15, 2003, he went into his room, put a belt around his neck, and hanged himself. Stuff like this is not supposed to happen in middle America, well-educated community. But the fact of the matter is, it is going on. For Taylor Hooten, steroids exacted a price out of all proportion to his goal. He wasn't aiming for a major league contract or a seven-figure salary. He just wanted what any team wants, to belong. After Taylor died, several of the kids in particular that were on Taylor's team admitted to, to my wife and I that they had been doing steroids. And, and for a period, most of them were scared straight. But something happened over time, something that's really, really scary. A number of those kids went back to using anabolic steroids within a few weeks after we put Taylor in the ground. The temptation to use steroids seemed to outweigh the perceived risks. But what could cause a healthy teen to take his own life? The answer lies deep in the brain. When you take steroids, your hypothalamus in your brain sees all of this steroid coming in from the outside. And so it sends a message down to the testis saying, we've already got plenty of steroids on board, don't manufacture any more, there's ample on, on supply already. Overwhelmed, the testes shut down, a condition called hypogonadism. Taylor stopped taking steroids cold turkey, leaving him low on testosterone and high on risk. They get profound depressions and they even get suicidal during that period when their testosterone level is, is low before the testis can come back online. In one survey of adults who use steroids, 4% reported attempting suicide during withdrawal. Other experts believe the numbers are far lower, but for Don Hooten, the statistics don't change his reality. His home run ball from June 16th of 2001, and the reason that's important, it was his first, and at the same time, his very last home run. Uh, I got to go chasing this out in the weeds after he hit it, uh, very much like uh, a dad would do when your kids just hit his first home run. Don Hooten now runs a foundation in Taylor's name to protect other teens from steroids. In 2007, Texas passed Taylor's Law, the nation's largest steroid screening program for high school athletes. But today, the fastest growing group of steroid users are not high school students or professional athletes. The stereotypical perception is some giant freak with a syringe sticking out of his forehead and, and, and you know, it's gonna eat my children for lunch and you know that's just the, the people are like they're like ah that's their perception the reality is that there's millions of people that use steroids that are out in the general public that you would have no idea that resemble an everyday person it's estimated that over 50 percent of all steroid users are not athletes of any kind the more typical steroid user is not someone in the upper levels of athletics and may not even compete in any athletic performance at all, but who uses the drugs largely for the purposes of personal appearance rather than to succeed at any specific competitive endeavor. A 2007 study suggests that many steroid users may actually be educated working professionals in their 30s. Everyday people turning to steroids just to look better. My gosh, we're living in a generation of, of young men and women that have been brainwashed by Madison Avenue to be buffed. We're living in a generation where all they know is instant gratification. Something they hope steroids can deliver. From Mr. Universe to the boy next door, anybody can be tempted by steroids, even the very best. Out. 
At the 2000 Summer Olympics in Sydney, the American track and field star Marion Jones won five medals. Sports writers crowned her the greatest female athlete in the world. However, in 2007, she admitted using steroids while training for the Summer Games. Her world records were invalidated, her medals forfeited. At age 31, one of the world's greatest female athletes announced her retirement from her sport. As a trainer, do I want my athletes on steroids? Well, obviously not. But as a consumer, you're demanding. You're demanding the very best out of athletes. And those athletes are going to do what they can to get that to happen. And when they do that, they start to push that limit. And that's a limit that you know, unfortunately, is found in that anabolic steroid. If athletes still use steroids in the most drug-tested competition, where won't they use them? Oddly, in the very sport where they may be most abused. In an ocean of steroids, a handful of athletes are swimming against the tide. In Portland, Maine, begins a competition with unusual athletes, natural bodybuilders rebels in a sport infected by steroids. These athletes reject steroids, both the benefits and the costs. And no one knows the costs better than their coach, former Mr. Universe and ex-steroid user, Steve Mahalik. Okay guys, uh, this is what it's all about. All that hard work you put in the gym just announced for a few minutes on stage, so just really enjoy yourself. From Watertown, Massachusetts, please welcome contestant number eight, Michael Manovian. The most formidable challenger here is unseen, temptation. Winning is intoxicating, and steroids are enticing, even to a man they'd nearly killed. I will have suffered through the stroke the heart attack, the liver disorders, the mental disorders, the mental anguish. But what I personally do it again, yes, that's, listen to the drawer of that stuff. For one moment in time, Steve Mahalik was the best there was on planet Earth, number one. That's a hard thing to discount. Come on, everything you got. At Mahalik's gym on Long Island, he trains a new generation of bodybuilders to do as he says not as he did. These kids and these, these grown men need a leader. They need someone who's been there. They need someone who can take them to the place they want to go without getting sick or ill. Bear the pain, spare the shame. Let's go. So what I try to do when a guy's sincere, I will teach them how to exercise and have a degree of muscle that their genetics will allow them to have and make them understand that that's as good as you're going to get. I'm looking, I'm watching the muscle. They got a lot in them. There you go, baby. All right. It's very difficult for them to win in the arena of a steroid contest in bodybuilding. You can win clean in natural contests, and you can win clean up to certain levels in pro contests. Boy, from golfer to bodybuilding. Just after that, you cannot. That's the truth. It's a harsh reality for athletes. For many, steroids can be priceless the difference between a salary and a fortune, between mediocrity and stardom. One of our patients was able to summarize it in just a single word, namely, why should I be Clark Kent when I can be Superman? If there was a drug available to allow a journalist to win the Pulitzer or allow me to win the Nobel Prize, I pretty well think they'd be injecting that drug on the steps of Old Main here at Penn State. Other experts place blame elsewhere. I think the people to blame are us, the consumers of sport. We want to see numbers. We want to see performances. We want to see more home runs. We want to see faster 100-meter dashes. The fact of the matter is, you want our athletes using steroids.